All right, here. Uh, hang on one second. All right, can everybody see the screen here? That looks good, Mike. All right, then we'll get started. So we're going to talk a little bit about the June 6, 2020 Rocky Mountain Duratio. There are two big Duratios in 2020. Uh, the one over in the Midwest in Iowa, that one certainly got much more attention. So this is what we call the other Duratio over in 2020. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some impacts in the forecast and evolution over in the Grand Junction uh, office where I was at the time. Uh, and then Paul's going to discuss a little bit more about the synoptic setup and the impacts and radar analysis from over on the Boulder side of the mountains. Uh, so we'll get started here. Just a little overview. Uh, on the right, you can see all the uh, local storm reports that were sent out over the course of uh, June 6, 2020, stretching from all the way in far southeast Utah, all the way up into North Dakota. This was a very, very large event. Uh, as far as the western slope of Colorado uh, and eastern Utah go, it was a really, really fascinating event. We had 30 wind and hail LSRs across the forecast area, four high wind gusts uh, LSRs, including a 99 mile per hour gust at the Great Divide Ross site up in uh, Moffat County, northwest Colorado. This is the most 75 mile an hour gusts or higher from a convective event in the forecast office's history. Uh, so that was quite a fascinating uh, detail there. 24 separate severe thunderstorm warnings uh, over in the junction forecast area, and you can see our uh, stats and lead time, uh, average lead time of 21 minutes uh, in those warnings. And this is primarily a morning and early afternoon event. Um, and uh, of course, verification stats out in the west, west of the Continental Divide are often influenced by the remote uh, aspects of the of that area because there's simply just not a whole lot of ob sites or people to see stuff happen out there. Uh, but it was still fairly impressive to get what we uh, got out of that event. So SPC outlooks and watches, uh, as far as Western Colorado goes, uh, in the junction forecast area, it was the first SPC slight risk uh, in quite a while for a variety of the locations. Uh, it had been since 2018 for any portion of that forecast area to have a slight risk. Uh, in the Four Corners area, the most recent one prior to 2020 was 2017. And as far as the most populated urban corridor in Western Colorado, Eastern Utah, and the Grand Valley, it had been since 2013 since a slight risk had been issued for that area. Um, and in addition, we had a severe thunderstorm watch out uh, and that was the first severe thunderstorm watch for the uh, Grand Junction forecast area since 6-16-2015. Uh, so you could see that watch that was issued uh, down in the bottom right, covering all counties of that forecast area. And you could also see the four panel SPC outlook for 6-6-2020. Uh, this was the 12, um, let's see, when was this one issued here? This was the 60 uh, first issuance for the day. Uh, showing the, uh, the hatched wind there on the bottom left uh, being the most primary focus for this event. Uh, so overview, what happened? You could see the outlook with the reports as they stretched up into uh, the central and northern high plains. Uh, Storm Prediction Center put this nice track summary together showing the evolution of the main uh, front uh, and um, I guess gust front that developed with the derecho uh, starting really early in the morning down there, 1515Z in southeast Utah and stretching all the way up into North Dakota uh, after midnight on the following morning. 339 total wind reports, 67 wind damage reports. Um, there was uh, a bit of significant hail. Uh, this, the hail reports actually primarily occurred early on in southeast Utah uh, as the early convection really got going. Uh, and there were also two uh, confirmed tornadoes with this event, uh, possibly more uh, due to the remoteness of where they may have occurred, QLCS nature of some of the tornadoes. Uh, that's likely why there were only two reports received. Uh, could have been more from this event. Uh, and as a historical perspective, uh, of course, having a, a large scale wind event derecho in this area of the country is exceedingly rare. However, it's not completely unprecedented. Uh, there was another event that occurred 
Uh, great Basin Duratio, May 31st, 1994. You could see that uh, event up there in the top left and all the associated uh, wind reports that were uh, received from that event as it moved from Nevada through Utah and portions of far northwest Colorado and into Wyoming. Um, uh, so these are very rare, but they're not entirely unprecedented. So we'll take a little closer look as to why this one occurred uh, with Paul here on the next slide. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so from the synoptic perspective, this is an animation. It's a little slower animation, but it's an animation of the 500 millibar heights and winds. The hatched areas you see um, are greater than 40 knots. So, I mean, any time of year, this is pretty good. But for early June, um, you know, we're all weather, weather weenies. We like to see good storms. This was a very dynamic system with uh, around 70 knots at 500 millibars spreading over, especially Western Colorado. The, the trough actually lifts across Northeast Colorado and then into Wyoming. So um, that kind of points to the fact that there, that Mike's area, Grand Junction across Southeast Utah, Western Colorado, was gonna have a little bit more instability than we had because the, the trough of our, or the pool of cold air aloft really uh, kind of skirted over his area and kind of missed our area especially east of the mountains. Um, so, but yeah, very dynamic system. That that was the key point to this, that for early June, seeing 70, 80 knot winds at 500 millibars was a big deal. Next slide, Mike. Okay, here we're looking at the NAFE's uh, meridional wind on the left, standardized anomaly. Um, and that's obviously the, the kind of the north-south direction. And we're looking at uh, five, about five standard deviations uh, positive for 500 millibar winds on the left side. Uh, that's across Western Colorado there. So um, just pointing to how, just how anomalous that flow was uh, in, the, in a southerly Southwest direction. On the right is the 700 millibar, you know, very similar. And that's even showing standard deviations well above six. Um, it, it's gray across Western Colorado because that's kind of where the center of the 700 millibar low was. So there wasn't any fantastic winds at this snapshot in time over West Central Colorado. But suffice to say, um, if you can picture the in-between images, as that 700 millibar trough moved from uh, Eastern Utah into Western Colorado and then, then Northeast into um, Southeast Wyoming, all ahead of that system, 700 millibar winds were ex on, on the far extreme side of what's what's uh, climatologically normal for, for this time of year and in this location. Mike, next. Taking a look at Grand Junction sounding. Um, one reason we wanted to do this was to contrast the environment near Grand Junction versus what it was like east of the continental divide, you know, the lower elevations of eastern Colorado. Um, Grand Junction's entire sounding was nice and moist. It had a nice skinny cape profile, uh, precipital water over an inch, which that's fantastic for early June. Uh, everyone gets excited about precipitation chances when it's that high in early June. Um, cape values approaching about a thousand. You can see some evidence of the strong or highly anomalous winds with 50 knots at 500, but it, it was much stronger than that uh, as with, uh, with the leading edge of the convection. Um, a, as we showed earlier, it was around 70 to 80 knots. So this was this was a little before the strongest winds or, or maybe a little after. I'm not exactly sure which one with that. Uh, should be before the winds, right? Because it was 12Z. Before, before the strongest winds uh, uh, spread overhead, but nice convective environment for Western Colorado. And then next slide, Mike. Um, around zero Z is when the derecho moved over the divide and then into um, the plains of Colorado. So now we are getting a good sense. Um, if you look at the winds here, that is 65 knots at 700 or just above 700, around 70 knots in between 700 and 500. Uh, really dry low levels. So you can imagine evaporation uh, it was going to help, or uh, the convective cold pool and evaporation would help drive the derecho quickly to the east as it came out of the mountains across the eastern plains with that type of dry air in the low levels. Um, Cape on this particular instance was very low, and I, I would agree 
this isn't that bad of a representative sounding. I, we were estimating Cape maybe up to 500, maybe across uh, the plains of Colorado as the convective system rolled through. So just much drier than what Grand Junction was seeing. Um, but the winds were there. The 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 dynamic of the the dyna dynamics of the system, and the winds aloft, especially right off the deck. I mean, there's 55 knots right off the deck uh, above Denver. There, it wouldn't take much evaporative cooling. It wouldn't take much precipitation to drive those winds towards the surface, uh, and that's what we saw. So next slide. Just showing what the Cape was, um, contrasting, this is from the 15Z run. So the storms had just gotten going across southeast Utah. So early in the loop, uh, this would be a representative uh, Cape across uh, Grand Junction's area. And clearly there's well over a thousand Cape ahead of the system here uh, before it gets well into the mountains and then across the Eastern Plains. Around 23Z to zero Z, um, that's when you can really see um, across northeast Colorado, the Cape values really diminish. Um, that's that's likely mostly due to the dry air near the surface. There is there is some pretty good Cape uh, right there across Larimer and Weld counties. That's just south of Cheyenne and the Fort Collins area. So according to the HER, it, it thought there'd be maybe a, maybe close to a thousand Cape in that part of the derecho, um, but when you look at the radar, I, I would uh, I would expect that the capes were not that high. Um, when we look at the radar, I think you all will agree. So, Mike, next slide. So, not all that unstable. I think the main point here is that um, if if we're contrasting the 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 Midwest derecho that really just clobbered Iowa and Illinois and, and on, in those areas, Cape values were extreme in that particular event. Cape. The instability here was, you know, it was average for early June. It was pretty low. It was it was decent in western Colorado, but still we're we're talking thousand joules per kilogram is what we were looking at for the most part. Here's the her composite reflectivity in general. Um, and again, this is 15Z, so convection had already initiated. So it should have had the benefit of ingesting the radar data before this run. Just in a nutshell, overall, the HER was just way too slow uh, with the derecho. It was several hours behind the actual movement of the derecho. It was it was already by um gosh by by 22Z. It was already near Denver, pretty much. It was pretty close to Denver by 22Z, and it also wasn't quite strong enough. The if you check the winds, which we're, we don't have time to show the wind output, but um, I'm sure none of you will be surprised to hear that the surface winds, the surface wind gusts were about half too strong across the entire course of the derecho as it moved across Colorado. Um, so Mike, next slide. And I think I'm gonna turn it back to you after this one, if I'm correct. Yeah, Mike, if you wanna take this one, um, then go from there. Sounds good, Paul. <clears throat> this is a composite radar loop, uh, just showing the evolution of the entire event uh, throughout the entire day. So we'll let this play through once more and you can see that early convection firing up here in southeast Utah, forming into this linear event as it moved throughout western Colorado. Uh, kind of falling apart a little bit on radar as it moved over the mountains and the divide itself before it sort of cascaded down into uh, the Front Range Urban Corridor and moved on from there. Let this play through one more time so you can get a sense of how the event evolved. And some of the strongest winds occurred right in this time frame as it moved uh, from sort of the Steamboat Moffat County area over towards Winter Park over the Front Range and onward from there. So we'll move forward a slide here and talk about a little bit of the model data. How did the models handle this uh, in a little bit more detail here? So. Uh, HREF, obviously a great resource for going back and looking at these events from a convective perspective here. So you can see the HREF Ensemble mean 500 millibar wind speed showing that very potent uh, wind speed maximum as Paul was discuss, uh, discussing moving through uh, Western Colorado and over the divide right there. Um, over here on the right, we have the 24 max updraft velocity from all cams uh, from the event. Oops. Uh, and you can see that there were uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, UH swaths over eastern Utah and western Colorado, which is a very, very odd place to be seeing this. Uh, 
But uh, I think the main takeaway here uh, from seeing a signature like this is that there were going to be some individual uh, cells, potentially even supercells, to deal with early on in the event before uh, those cells gusted out and merged and formed a more potent uh, consolidated cold pool that moved through. So uh, that was one of the things that um, over on the Grand Junction side of the mountain uh, was important to keep an eye on uh, early in the event. And you can see uh, later on how that eventually evolved here. Uh, another thing to point out here uh, is that uh, the seeding of the environment is a big player uh, over in the west. Anywhere west of the divide, it's very hard to advect that Gulf moisture west of the continental divide. It can happen very rarely in at times. It could also happen in the monsoon season. Uh, but as far as like true springtime convective events, uh, you almost need to manufacture dew points uh, west of the divide to get good convection. Uh, and a way to do this is to have morning precipitation, which we did with this event in western Colorado. Um, so you could see over there on the left-hand side, the HRF showing the ensemble mean uh, two-meter dew points of uh, 50 plus in a lot of the lower basins out here uh, in eastern Utah and western Colorado. Um, and then you can see the result and effect of that. Oops, you can see the result and effect of that on the uh, instability right here with uh, over a thousand joules per kilogram uh, as far as surface based CAPE ensemble means over there. And uh, to see those type of levels uh, over in Western Colorado is again, uh, highly anomalous, uh, very rare to get dew points above 50 um, outside of the monsoon season over there. So, uh, that was certainly an eye opener, something that not a lot of forecasters had really ever seen in a few years uh, over in that direction. So moisture and instability, always the problem of the day out west. Um, the big thing was going to be, would there be enough clearing behind that morning precipitation uh, to allow for some instability to build? Uh, because we only needed a little bit with, that, uh, with those dynamics in place overhead. Uh, would those dew points mix out? Uh, would we have enough cape? Sort of a balance uh, out west. Uh, whether you keep enough of that moisture uh, and get a little bit of instability, or you heat it up and you mix the entire thing out, because usually it's a very, very shallow moisture layer. Uh, so you can see this satellite image on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, goes 16 viz and GLM around 16Z uh, on the 6th, showing that early morning precipitation here in, in central Colorado, that uh, brief area of clearing that lasted about maybe two to three hours or so, which was just enough to develop that instability. Uh, and then the uh, developing duration in its early stages uh, behind that clearing right there. Uh, this was shortly after a lot of the early individual cells began to merge into a linear event. Uh, and you can also see the WPC surface analysis over here on the right at 15Z, showing that dew point at 59 at Grand Junction, 58 at Moab. Um, so some really ex extraordinary numbers over there. Uh, so radar evolution, uh, convective initiation was already underway in far Northeast Arizona by 15Z. Uh, you can see a couple of those early cells down there, down there in the Navajo Reservation. Um, overall, model reflectivity from a lot of the members of the HRF at the time did a fairly outstanding job on the positioning of the initial cells uh, and the fact that it was going to form into an MCS. Uh, as Paul had mentioned in a previous slide, however, the time uh, timing lagged uh, and the event evolved and moved much faster than forecast by nearly all the cams. And often this is the case in highly forced environments. This is certainly not anything new. Um, but one model that did all right with the timing still, it was still a little bit slow, but it was a little bit better than the rest was the NAM nest. So we'll just step through a couple images here, comparing the uh, zero Z run of the NAM nest the night before uh, with the radar as it evolved. You can see a 15 Z, those initial cells down in far Southeast Utah and Northern Arizona. Uh, pretty close to where it had it on the 0Z NAM at the 15Z forecast. Um, 
You can see by 18Z, uh, where the NAM nest had that line of precipitation moving into southern Mesa County, right over top of the Moab area. And at 1730Z, this is the junction radar, you see that line is already well uh, beyond uh, Moab here and almost on the threshold of Grand Junction itself. So already off by about an hour or two uh, in timing. Moving ahead a little bit further, you can see what the radar looked like at 19Z, uh, storms from Glenwood Springs in the Aspen area up through uh, Craig and entering southeast, uh, sorry, southern Wyoming. And the NAM, uh, NAST at 18Z, barely had anything into southeast Wyoming, only the northern fringes of the event uh, sort of supporting that uh, little bit of a lag as well. Uh, so there was a little bit of three ingredients method uh, used during this event too. I figured I'd throw this slide in here as well as a, as a good reminder. Not something that we get to use very often uh, west of the divide. However, there were uh, a couple signatures of note uh, that moved through um, western Colorado. You can see this one here. This was up north of uh, Grand Junction, sort of in one of the more remote areas of the entire country, uh, let alone our forecast area. Um, in the Tabaputs range in east central Utah. Uh, our radar was showing uh, three ingredients indicators, number one, possibly two, three, six, and seven, so an enhanced surge. Uh, a little bit of an inflection point here along the line of the, uh, the squall line. Um, inflow, uh, paired front and rear inflow notch potentially as well. Uh, and also a tight and strong uh, potential mesovortex on radar there as well. So as far as Western Colorado, we didn't receive any tornado reports, uh, no reports of any uh, damage on that nature. There was a uh, tornado reported and confirmed by a damage survey up in the Cheyenne forecast area in the Snowy Range. Um, there was certainly potentially one or two more of these out in the, uh, uh, out in the West, but um, unfortunately we may never know the true extent of, of how many uh, potential QLCS tornadoes occurred that day. Um, I'll turn it over to Bo uh, Paul now for uh, a little bit of a summary on what occurred in the Boulder CWA. Yep, thanks, Mike. Next slide. If you, let's see, go next slide. Oh, there we go. Just really quick showing on this slide. It's, it's all of our warnings, all of our LSRs. And I just wanted to flag or highlight for you some of the higher wind speeds that we saw measured. These are all measured wind speeds. The numbers you see there are measured wind speeds. Um, the higher elevation ones, the 90 and 110 on the west side of our CWA there on the on the left side of the graphic, those are high elevation ones. Um, still pretty impressive, but you know, we're talking those are above 11,000 feet. As we got into the metro Denver area, most of the wind speeds were between 70 and 80, um, all across metro Denver. And then further east across the plains, we kind of had an outlier near Lyman, and that's in the, the lower right of the image, 85 miles an hour. And, and it, the derecho just kept going. We had gusts over 60 to near 80 miles per hour as it made it into the Nebraska panhandle um, later that evening. So next slide. One of the interesting quirks of this particular event, because the storm was moving so fast and we were confident all along the line there were gonna be severe wind gusts, uh, we ended up issuing the largest severe thunderstorm warning in, in, in uh, our history here. Um, it was over 8,000 square miles. 3.8 million people were inside that warning. The warning itself was slightly smaller than the state of New Jersey and just another weird quirk. It kind of looked like Alabama, the warning, um, mainly because of how we drew it and how it butted up next to El Paso County, which is in Pueblo's area. So just a nice little, a fun little quirk there. Um, and I th we stand by that warning. I, I'm not sure of a better way to split up that warning given how fast the derecho was moving. Next slide. This did lead to, just wanted to, to take a sidebar for a one minute about um, a nice DSS success story that we had with this. Um, remember early June, this was 2020, there were COVID testing sites, uh, uh, mass COVID testing sites all over our area. I'm sure all over your areas too. This particular one was near the Pepsi Center. That the All the white um, supports in the background there, that's a roller coaster in downtown Denver. Uh, the Pepsi Center, which is now Ball Arena, I believe, um, 
is in downtown Denver, and we had a, it's a mass testing site back in early June. Uh, you can see there are tents, there were employees, there were volunteers all over this place in a giant parking lot, exposed to the wind in downtown Denver. So we knew that we knew based on the early convection in Grand Junction and based on how anomalous that trough was for early June that we were going to get some pretty intense convection, especially for wind. So we gave a morning heads up call based on the convection that we saw in Western Colorado to this event, um, just letting know, hey, prepare. Uh, we're probably going to get some pretty intense winds later. And then right before, as the derecho was coming out of the mountains, you're going to see it wasn't that impressive on radar, but as it was coming out of the mountains, we knew we were going to get winds. So we called them, gave them a heads up. Hey, expect up to 70 mile per hour winds. Gave them a time window. Issued the warning very shortly after that. So everything was kind of lining up. Um, what they did, though, they had about 45 minutes to secure all their assets, which meant tying down the tents, taking down what, what was going to blow away, securing everything they could. And then uh, we got report back that um, they were able to, there were no injuries, and they were able to, um, to secure most of their high value things. The things that weren't secured uh, blew, were thrown hundreds of feet into the air, were the reports we got when the 70 mile per hour winds hit. So they were very appreciative uh, of our heads up calls and, you know, in our, our uh, we, we took care of them. Next slide, please. So the impacts to ours, we did have 101 measured severe wind gusts. 38 of those measured gusts were over 70 miles per hour. Every single county in our area verified other than Jackson County, which is our least populated. Um, it's, it's right against the Wyoming border in a mountainous area and 1,000 people live in the entire county, one to 2,000 people. So we're pretty sure it had severe winds. It just didn't happen to hit the one ASOS observation we have out in Walden there. Damage in general was just mainly tree damage across most, most of the area. Uh, and some outbuildings were damaged or destroyed in a few areas where the winds were a little bit more intense. Uh, these are some of the images from uh, the, the lower left one is more uh, rural northeast Colorado showing a, an outbuilding kind of destroyed pretty good. And then the other two, um, mid, bottom middle and bottom right, were in Metro Denver. Next slide. So we got an ACAR sounding with moisture. So I guess it's technically an MVSS uh, sensor on an aircraft that was descending into Denver. And this was as proximity as it could get it. I think at, right at 20Z, the, um, the derecho moved through right, right over the airport pretty much. So this is pretty darn close to proximity. And note, uh, we showed the 0Z Denver sounding, which showed very similar things, very dry boundary layer. Um, and extreme winds right off the deck. That's about 45 knots right off the deck. So it was windy even before the derecho moved through. We, we had south to southwest winds ahead of the 700 millibar trough. Uh, strong winds aloft. Instability was probably around three, let's see. This one doesn't actually show the instability, but you, you can see where the positive area was based on that parcel curve I drew. And it, it was around 300 uh, joules per kilogram, more or less, surface-based cape. Um, so very, it was mainly just weak convection, but so much strong winds aloft and, and enough drier in the low levels that um, there's plenty of momentum transfer to bring those winds to the surface. So next, next one, Mike. We also have access to a profiler uh, near Platteville. Platteville is, oh, it's probably about 25 miles north of Denver and north northwest of Denver International Airport. And this just kind of shows the progression of how the winds ramped up from that morning. And then as the trough approached, uh, we started to get the really strong winds aloft. And, you know, on the, on the left there, 20 to 21 Z, just out ahead of the line is where we saw those winds ramp up to uh, 45 to 50 knots, just off the deck, um, unidirectional the whole way up. So all, all this supports a, uh, you know, a, a raging derecho other than the lack of it, it pretty weak instability so this is again just driven by the by the winds aloft mainly next mike yeah go ahead i, I highlighted that myself okay surface winds uh as I, as I pointed to it was windy before the line even moved through i mean we got gusts if you look in the metro denver area out at dia gust of 45 knots already this is ahead of the line out of the out of the out of the south 
all across eastern Colorado was gusting 30 to 40 knots before the line moved through. So, and then the uh, check out the temperature dew point spreads. You know, temperatures were in the low to mid 80s, and dew points were in the low to mid 40s. So plenty of evaporative potential. Get a little bit of precip aloft. It's going to evaporate. It's going to drive the winds that are already strong aloft towards the surface. Uh, this is going to be one heck of an outflow dominant system, and uh, we're going to show that next. Go ahead, Mike. Just this is just a little eye candy. It's it's IR satellite. Um, it, it encompasses the whole event from right now. There's the convection that produced the derecho in western Colorado. It's a nice discrete cloud band there. It's moving over the mountains now. It's strongest on the southern end. And now it's moving over Metro Denver. And those, those cold cloud tops weren't really that cold uh, throughout the whole thing. We can let it go one more time. The radar the radar's a little bit more telling and a little more interesting. Said by a radar geek, of course. Let's go ahead, Mike. Let's Let's look at the radar. So we had the storm motion clocked at 65 miles an hour. This is the this is the northern view of the line. You're looking so Denver DIA is at the very bottom of the screen, um, where all those interstates come together in the blue. I-25 is dead center of the screen, which moves up to Cheyenne at the top of the screen. So this is the northern front range, northern plains as it comes out of the mountains. We'll watch this again, and as you can see, reflectivities were eh, they're 40, 45, maybe up to 50 dBZ absolutely no hail there was no there wouldn't be, the instability wouldn't suggest it how fast the storm is moving and how slanted the updraft was you wouldn't expect hail to begin with and it, we didn't there wasn't any um you can also see that the gust front was out ahead of the line we'll zoom in a little bit on that in a little bit but you can see that the gust front was running racing well out ahead of the line for most of the most of the life of this convective system you can also see it's kind of a broken line too uh, I think that points to a lack of really good instability. Next, Mike. Here's the velocity data. It really, and I'll show the southern half of this. Most of the time near the radar in the, where it's cl the beam's closest to the ground, uh, it's, per it's uh, perpendicular to the radar beam. So you don't see a whole lot in this, except for right near the radar at the very bottom of the screen. You can see those 50 knot winds. Uh, blowing through there. Mike, let's go to the southern end here. A little more interesting. Because you, you actually, the, the winds are parallel to the beam. Okay, so now Metro Denver is on the northern half of the screen. Um, this this shows it going through um, Colorado Springs and Denver. And the you can see the gust front racing out ahead of the line again. Reflectivities are generally pretty low. And it's very broken, as you can see. And gosh, uh, it didn't look like much coming out of the mountains. Part of that is because this is a half degree tilt and our half degree tilts are partially blocked for our mountainous areas on the, the left side of the screen. So you're really only getting, oh, the top half of the storm probably. Um, but believe me, if you looked at the 0.9 and the 1.3 tilts, it still didn't look like much. Um, these, are, these are just very shallow, it was shallow convection, um, not very strong. And with the beam blocked, you weren't seeing a whole lot anyway until it finally got out of the mountains across the I-25 corridor, and then you can see it a little bit better. Mike, let's go to the next one. It'll be velocity. We'll just let this run, and you can see it a little bit better because in general, the strongest winds were just south of west, and so on the southwest quadrant of the radars where you can really see those winds ramp up as it moves through. I'll let this run a couple more times. All right, next slide, Mike. Just to show you how shallow the convection is, we, we cut a cross section using GR analysts parallel to the storm motion through the, and this is the most intense part of the line. Uh, check out how shallow it is. It doesn't need, it barely got to 20,000 feet, barely to 20,000 feet. Um, we didn't get any lightning reports at all. So technically it wasn't a thunderstorm. There might, there was some lightning in Pueblo's area on the southern part of the line where instability was better. But in our area, not so much lightning. And you can see why. The heaviest reflectivity is confined to the lowest 5,000 feet, all in the liquid phase part of this uh, storm. So 
Uh, did did not look like much aloft, that's for sure. Next one, Mike. Zooming in just on the winds, this is at 0.9, so we're getting above a lot of the clutter. Uh, the leading edge of the line is the the white line there, and just this just really shows how widespread those you know the strong winds were. And I think again that points to the fact that it was the winds were very strong aloft. It just didn't take much convection didn't take strong convection by any means to force those winds towards the surface all across Metro Denver there. Okay, next one. Summarizing this, so this was unusual. Uh, Mike did a really nice job providing historical context on just how unusual it was for Western Colorado and even, even our part of Colorado. We don't, we don't see derechos either on the Eastern half of Colorado. Uh, there were widespread 80, 60 to 80 mile per hour winds all across its track, even as it went up into Nebraska and South Dakota. Um, we believe the, the the main story here was the strong upstream trough and the extreme winds, you know, five to eight standard deviations above normal, above normal for that time of year in that location uh, in early June. There was there was some instability, especially across western and southern Colorado, but where some of the strongest winds occurred, at least in our area, Northeast Colorado and the Denver metro area, we had less than 500 joules per kilogram cape. Uh, the derecho itself was very outflow dominant and was moving at 65 miles per hour. So um, I know we've all looked at the Midwest derecho uh, from the same year that went across Iowa, totally different character, nature of the storm, instability. Uh, I mean, it, they couldn't be more different uh, other than the fact that they both generated some pretty intense winds, obviously nothing like this one did not have anything like the the Iowa and Illinois derecho, obviously, but it was still uh, pretty impressive nonetheless, especially for for our area where we we rarely get QLCSs to begin with, let alone derechos. Mike, I believe we're at the end. We can take some questions. And did you want to add anything, Mike, to the to the summary? Any, any closing thoughts? Not really. Um, I guess just mentioning that, you know, knowing your forecast area and sort of having a handle on what is truly an eye-opening parameter or not is is a major takeaway from this. You know, we all stare at model data all the time. And what really was, what really jumped out about the Western Colorado aspect of this was those dew points being so high and having that perspective on the anomalies uh, for those uh, mid and upper level winds. Um, so I think it's always a good reminder for forecasters to continually look at those resources, um, those anomaly maps, uh, and sort of develop that, um, that mental outlook of, of what is truly an eye-opening parameter in your forecast area. Because you know, when once we saw these kind of things, even at, at a very long range, um, it was kind of it was already concerning. Like, hey, if this materializes, this could be one heck of an event, something that we haven't seen in, in quite a few years. So um, that's all I'll mention about that. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Randy, I think we're ready for questions. <laughs> 